Abbott's bitters. They were for a time one of the most popular aromatic bitters in North America. However, after Prohibition, the brand began a slow decline, and eventually the bitters seemingly disappeared forever. Maybe. So what exactly made Abbott's bitters so popular? Well, it is said that it was the bitters of choice for the original Manhattan cocktail. So if you want to taste an original 1870s Manhattan, you need to use Abbott's aromatic bitters. Many people have researched the history of Abbott's bitters looking for the original recipe or little bits of information that may help them make a recreation. I'm going to provide some of the, the basic history and then I'll add my own research onto that at the end. According to Abbott's documentation, they started their bitters company in the late 1860s. And their first product was known as Abbott's Angostura Bitters. Now there was already an Angostura Bitters out there, the one that's still available today. However, that one was called Seagirt's Aromatic Bitters. And they did use the term Angostura. And eventually it led to a fairly major lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court in the U.S. in the 1880s where Angostura or Seagirt's uh, sued Abbott's and about infringing on their uh, trademark. Angostura won and Abbott's had to change their name and they eventually changed it to Abbott's Aromatic Bitters. After the legal issues, Abbott's continued on and they were actually a, a fairly successful company and they even survived prohibition. Not everything went smoothly. And there was a, an Abbott's Bitters reformulation and that happened sometime between the 1920s and the 1940s. Now, why would a company reformulate a very successful product? Some would say hubris, you know, they changed it because they could. Uh, that's not likely the case. Usually a reformulation happens when there's a production problem. And in this case, I believe it was the uh, loss of a key ingredient. And I'll expand on that later on. You can see from these pictures that the old Abbott's bottle is fairly nondescript aside from its trademark. And the new bottle actually highlights a lot of the ingredients in the bottle. And we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, ingredients once I explain how I came across this recipe for what I believe is the original Abbott's Bitters. Back in August 2009, I was up late one night looking at some databases of information, uh, some old archives that I had uh, access through the university that I worked at. And as I was searching, I came across a, a series of old Bitters recipes, and I just happened to going through them fairly quickly because there's a fair number of them and I found an interesting one read it towards the bottom of the paper and you know haphazardly saw an Abbott's name and then I moved on to the next bitters recipe and then another one and then another one but eventually it clicked that Abbott's you know bitters was an important bitters so I went back to that recipe and uh, I read it over a couple times and tried to compare it to what I knew about Abbott's and, you know, it wasn't Cornelius or C.W. Abbott, and it, uh, it didn't click. So, and the recipe had some similarities, but it seemed to be missing that clove element that everybody was talking about, because there was no cloves in the recipe. So I started doing some more research, and uh, I wanted to see if I could actually connect this Joe Abbott to Cornelius Abbott, who is the founder of uh, Abbott's Bitters. And so I did some of that, and I actually found out that they were cousins. Using Ancestry.com as, as the database for family information. And this Joe Abbott was an engineer. He wasn't uh, necessarily a, a bitters guy or a medicinal guy. But in the census, the U.S. Census from 1880, it lists him as uh, in food and beverages. In the 1870 census, he was listed as uh, an engineer. So at this point, I think I might have something. So I gather up my research, the recipe, and I said, uh, send an email to Ted Hay, who is probably the guy that's done the most research on Abbott's Bitters. Now at this point in time, I'd never actually tried Abbott's Bitters, but I had read a fair amount about it. The thing that did concern me was this lack of cloves uh, that everybody's talking about. You know, it, uh, I couldn't correlate that to the recipe because uh, there was no cloves in the recipe. But there was a mystery ingredient called canala bark. Canala being Spanish for cinnamon, I had assumed it was that, but it actually wasn't. It's a, it's a different type of bark. When I started doing some research on this canala bark, I discovered that it was closer to clove in flavor than cinnamon. 
which kind of really opened up the floodgates as to this really could be uh, an Abbott's recipe. Now, canala bark was listed in all of the uh, early pharmacopoeia. Um, it was a fairly common ingredient, and it was used as a tonic for upset stomachs. And it was exported heavily from the Bahamas. Uh, in 1876, it was 14,000 pounds a year was exported. And in 1879, that grew to 19,760 pounds. And so that's a fair amount of bark. And for uh, comparison, uh, the Bahamas was exporting 40,000 gallons of rum and only 5,000 pounds of sarsaparilla in 1879. And all of the articles that I've read about canala and all the information back in the 1800s is basically said, uh, canala was said to be a considerable article of export for the Bahamas, and it was. It was listed as a, a drug. Once you hit the early 1900s, the number of literary references to canala starts to decline, especially in its use as a medicine. And most of the references are now uh, biological or documenting species. And this goes on until about the 1960s when a lot of the references are talking about how scarce this uh, canala tree is. And one of the, the big indicators is that in Florida it is an endangered species, so you can't actually harvest it. And to me that's the greatest indicator that this actual bark was over harvested. Now in the early 1900s there wasn't any mechanism for companies or government to you know indicate a species was being over harvested so there, there's very little records on this to identify when exactly the uh, canal tree became sparse. So with a little speculation we could probably guess it was in the first half of the century and probably somewhere between 1920 and 1940 uh, and that would also match up with uh, Abbott's reformulating their bitters. Now the important part about the canala for the Abbott's bitters is that uh, this bark holds a lot of the same compounds that we smell in the bitters. So eugenol, which is from uh, cloves, and it also has meristicin, which is from nutmeg, and there are other oils that match up with with the aroma profile of Abbott's bitters. Now. GCMS, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry, is uh, the analysis, the chemical analysis of compounds. Having studied chemistry, it is a, a great way to analyze something and find out what it's made from. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite courses in school. Now, a very important part of this Abbott's Bitters Quest was uh, done by Robert Hess when he submitted a sample of an old bottle of Abbott's for GCMS analysis. However, the results from the analysis had a few potential flaws. Also, the interpretation of the resulting data was used incorrectly to reformulate the Abbott's recipe. Now here's an all too quick 30 second course on GC mass spec. Now the gas chromatography part, it basically separates all the compounds in a liquid, or in this case the bitters. So when you look at this graph, you'll see different peaks. Each one of those peaks is technically a separate compound. Now when we go to the mass spec part, uh, this is actually, the easiest way to describe it is a molecule's fingerprint. So this pattern of peaks is one molecule, uh, or one compound, but it, it's actually the fingerprint. Now this data is not conclusive. You usually have to bring in other stuff like infrared or other analytical methods. But this graph provides a lot of information for somebody who's skilled in this art to actually interpret what type of molecule it is. And honestly, it is similar to uh, solving something like a crossword puzzle where you're, you're taking a whole bunch of clues or pieces of information and you're going to assemble, instead of a word, you'd assemble uh, a molecule. This is the GC mass spec report that was given to Robert Hess, and it lists all the compounds that it found in uh, the Abbott sample. Looking at this report, uh, the first thing I noticed is the results are reported as grams, but they are essential oils, they are not whole spices. The way the GC mass specs works is that uh, when it gets a, a compound, it's basically a fingerprint. And it'll match that fingerprint compound up to, into a database. There's not a chemist sitting there, you know, reading all of these charts all the time. They do it once, create a fingerprint, and then the computer will handle all of that sorting of information.
And one of the issues with a lot of the recipes for rabbits on the internet is that everybody read this to mean spices or grams of spices. And so they scaled it up and created a, a recipe on it. The reality is this is all essential oils because according to the information given to me by Robert, uh, this was run against a perfume database and perfumes are made out of essential oils. Also in the report, you'll see terms like absolute or hyper absolute, synthetic FCC, and natural. And those are generally terms used to describe essential oils. So if you wanted to actually recreate the Abbott's as per what was detected in the bottle, you would take this recipe, buy all those essential oils and some of the chemicals, mix them together, and then you would actually have something similar to what was in the bottle. Another thing that jumps out at me is a couple of the results seem off the scale, so notably clove and tonka bean. This could be caused by sampling technique or method. Uh, there are multiple methods for GC uh, mass spec analysis. Some of it's uh, headspace analysis or direct injection. Um, if it's direct injection, there is a possibility that the sample wasn't emulsified or blended so that it was uh, uniform throughout. And this can cause, you know, these oddball results. And of, uh, oftentimes when you do GC mass spec or you're analyzing a sample, you're going to do it in triplicate. And I'm not sure if this was. If it was just a single run, then you get a lot of error in these things. So the reality is, is it, it, without that information, you have to take all of this with a grain of salt. And the last thing is that obviously this is data from an 80-year-old sample, or possibly older. And it doesn't account for the decomposition of volatile essential oils. Mass spec is only going to tell you what's in the bottle now. But again, this information is extremely useful if you know how to use it, especially when you're comparing it to a recipe that you have now. I just wanted to talk a little bit about these two oddball results. The first is the, the tonka bean content. And again, the mass spec's not saying is saying that there's tonka bean, but not necessarily coumarin. We don't know how that database uh, is matching the tonka bean compound, whether it is coumarin or another compound in the tonka bean. What I do know is the recipe I have does not have tonka bean, but there is a possibility that one of the ingredients, uh, anise seed, uh, will break down into tonka bean-like or vanilla-like compounds, which may be interpreted by the database as um, being tonka bean instead of the original compound that it was 80 years ago. And then obviously the clove result. Uh, the clove result seems extremely high. And I'm not sure whether the sample was run in triplicate or it was just a single run. If it was run in triplicate, the result would have uh, more relevance. But if not, then, you know, the margin of error is extreme. So we can't really tell with that. And clove oil is fairly stable, so it's not going to break down over time. So depending on how the bottle of Abbott's aged, clove may be one of the last compounds to really stand out, unlike the rest, which may have broken down. And that brings us to another uh, simple issue is that when you look at the mass spec results or the report, you're looking at those in uh, grams, but those don't equate to grams of spice because each spice will have its own quantity of oils. So, for example, canola bark has, you know, one to one and a half percent volatile oils. You know, clove could have double that amount. So basically, it's far more complex and simply weighing out the equal amount of grams, what you really need to know is the, the quantity of oil in each of those whole spices, and then you'd have to mix it that way. There are other ingredients in a, a compound or a liquid that can't be detected by a GC mass spec. One of the uh, clues you see right on the bottle of all these uh, Abbott's bitters, and that's why would Abbott's bitters be good on a grapefruit? and that's in a lot of their marketing material. And the reality is it's sugar. So when you look at this GC mass spec result, uh, you don't see any sugar, and that's because sugar is not volatile. It's hard to, you'd have to use a, like liquid chromatography instead of gas chromatography. But sugar would obviously be a, a very important ingredient. It's gonna change the, the whole flavor profile of the bitters if it's missing. So when I found this, what I believe to be the original Abbott's recipe, I had to correlate what the tasting notes are for the old bottles of bitters today 
with this original recipe. And obviously, bitters are very complex. They usually contain, you know, half a dozen or more different spices and herbs, and a lot of them are very volatile, so they'll decompose over time. And also, depending on how they're stored, whether they're high proof or more water based, there can be a lot of changes that go on. And, you know, with chemistry, you can kind of understand how things will break down. And then you can correlate that to the flavor we have today. But you have to look at uh, oxidation and hydrolysis, which is reaction with water, whether it was exposed to light or heat, and how long it's been in the bottle. You take a look at uh, one of the ingredients in this recipe I found, which is aniseed. The key component of aniseed is anise oil. This oil is known to be you know, naturally unstable. It actually de decomposes at a rate of 1% per month in a clear bottle at room temperature. And air sealed samples show odor changes within 12 months of stored above 5 degrees Celsius. Now decomposition doesn't uh, necessarily mean it's bad. I mean, a lot of times it can be good. In this case, for example, when anise oil decomposes, you'll get uh, anise ketone, which is a sweet, fruity, spicy, balsam aroma. And another decomposition compound is anise aldehyde, and the para version, which is a chemistry term. But it's sweet, powdery, floral, hawthorn, again balsam. And then the ortho anise aldehyde is sweet, hawthorn, vanilla, coumarin, and almond. And so again, you know, we start to see this coumarin being a, a vanilla compound, and it, it has the potential to break down into that depending on how it's stored. Now, obviously, there are bad compounds that can break down too. Anisic acid, putrid, sweet, cadaverous, which is never good. But oddly, it's used as a perfume fixative. Um, and a fixative uh, helps to maintain those aromas so that they last longer instead of being extremely volatile. So as you can see, that some of these compounds, when they break down, lead to these you know, vanilla-like aromas that uh, people often talk about when they're describing old bottles of Abbott's bitters. And the, the two things that I hear most often are clove and vanilla. But again, it's far more complex than that. But it does give us uh, some insight into what's happening. And again, from my point of view, I have an old recipe that I need to kind of correlate to see how it would age. So when I can take a look at these uh, composition products, I can say that you know these vanilla compounds are accounted for even though the, this recipe I have does not have coumarin or tonka bean or vanilla in it. But it does, these old bottles have vanilla compounds and I, I can account for this by the breakdown of aniseed or anise oil. And obviously the more confidence I have in the recipe, the more likely I'm gonna try to, to develop it. Which leads us into the bark quest. Now usually finding a bark wouldn't be a quest. You know, you just go on the internet, order some spices, and then you'd be done. However, not in this case. Canala bark is not commercially available. It's not something you can go on the internet and order. Uh, even though I have tried, and what was sent to me was definitely not canala, it's usually uh, cinnamon, which is completely different to what the canala bark tastes like. The nice thing about the old documents is that they describe exactly how canela tastes and one of the key things is it's very spicy. Now finding the bark was quite the quest. It was uh, actually a lot of fun but uh, it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing. The first thing I had to do is find somebody in the Caribbean on an island who knew where canela was. Now you can't just fly to an island, walk into the woods and expect to find it it's a lot harder than you think it is. These trees are, again, fairly sparse, so you know you could probably spend days searching for them. And I didn't want to do that. So actually talking to Robert Hess, he gave me the idea of uh, searching his online database of worldwide bartenders. Looked around and there is one in the Caribbean by the name of Jesse Card. So I emailed Jesse. He said he'd help me as best he can, and so what he did was he talked to the agricultural people on the island. Uh, they said there was actually a patch in one of the parks that he could take a small sample from. Uh, we met at Tales of the Cocktail. And I took this 20 gram sample of bark back and it was enough to make two liters of Abbott's Bitters. So I aged it for probably eight weeks, nine weeks according to the recipe. I took a sample and I mailed it to Ted Hay uh, for a taste test. 
Ted tasted the bitters, and to paraphrase them, he basically said they're in the ballpark. Uh, they do have this anise-forward for flavor, um, or a freshness, and that's because they haven't been aged for years. I also gave Robert Hess a sample when we were in uh, Moscow for the Moscow Bar Show, and he tasted them, and he basically said they were the closest thing he's tasted yet. And an interesting thing is that uh, during this time period, I had never actually tasted Abbott's bitters. Uh, I just never had the opportunity to before I found this recipe, but once I found this recipe, I decided that I'd avoid tasting them, kind of from a scientific aspect to keep kind of the purity of the experiment. And that way I couldn't unduly influence the recipe, so I'd just make the recipe as it was and let other people do the tasting. And it was interesting to see, you know, people come back and say, yeah, this actually tastes pretty close. So with some general confirmation that this may be, in fact, Abbott's Bitters, uh, I had to go to the next step, which is to recreate the recipe in whole, which includes barrel aging. Now to produce the bitters, according to the recipe, you need a lot more bark than 20 grams. So I contacted Jesse again, and we set up a time for me to go down to St. Croix in May 2012 to harvest the bark. So I booked my flight, uh, checked into a hotel called the Pink Fancy, had a nice pool, and then Jesse and I went out for a few drinks, and then the next day we got started, and he took me out to basically this tropical forest where we could actually find the bark. We also enlisted the help of a, another local bartender, Troy, a.k.a. the Bark Whisperer. Now when it came time to harvest the bark, we wanted to do it in a sustainable way. So we didn't strip any trees completely of their bark. What we did was we'd take strips uh, vertically up the tree and we'd save a fair amount of bark around the tree. So we wouldn't actually wring the tree of its bark because that would cut off fluid flow to the top of the tree, therefore killing the tree. So we'd take small strips from sections and then move on to another tree. Now this is a lot more time consuming than taking one tree and stripping it down of the bark. But again, when you do these things, you have to take a no harm approach. You don't want to damage the environment just for the sake of some cocktail bitters. Now there were some hazards while harvesting the bark. The first was this wasp's nest that I came across while reaching in to grab some bark. Unfortunately, I took a sting from one of them in the wrist. And then there are these creatures. This is a centipede. It grows to a foot long, it's venomous, and it hunts mice for a living. And it lives in the underbrush. Jesse had given me fair warning not to disturb the underbrush uh, to avoid encountering these things, and if I did encounter one, to walk away quickly. There were also other hazards, like these rather large thorns that would easily pierce your shoe and go into your foot uh, if you stepped on them. And finally, we had to be cautious about venturing too far in the woods for fear of stumbling upon somebody's personal plantation. The locals can be a little protective of their high-value crops. All work and no play makes for a dull experience, so while on the island, Jesse took it upon himself to give me a, a great tour. And obviously one of the first places we had to hit was the Cruisin' Rum Distillery. And being a fan of rum, I had no complaints, and after that we eventually hit the Captain Morgan Distillery. A bit more commercial, but still, it's always fun to see how spirits are made. And then, of course, we checked out a few of the local restaurants and bars, and one of the cool ones is the Domino Club, where Jesse introduced me to Mama Wano, which is a, a rum concoction that's a mixture of rum, spices, honey, which is allowed to age for a couple weeks, which results in a very sippable liqueur. And in an interesting twist, some recipes for Mama Wano call for canala bark. And then for the next couple days, we continued to harvest bark. It took about three days between harvesting, going for lunch and having a drink at the beach, and then doing more harvesting, and then back to the beach for another drink. But we managed to get enough bark for one batch of Abbott's Bitters. And to close out my few days in St. Croix, Jesse and I headed down to the waterfront and watched basically girls play with fire. Over a couple drinks, of course. I know a place where the trade winds will slow your pace I know a place that is far removed from the rat race Next morning, Jesse, being the tremendous host he had been all week, picked me up at the hotel and drove me to the airport, where I began to explain to customs officers why I was carrying bark in my luggage. And all is well, I eventually hopped on the plane to Puerto Rico, then Detroit, 
and then drove across the Canada-US border and once again explained to the customs officers why I had bark in my luggage and no problem and then on home. Now that I had the key ingredient it was time to actually make a full batch of the Abbott's bitters. So I ordered the other half dozen ingredients that I needed for the recipe and started looking for a distiller that had access to high proof corn distillate and a bourbon barrel. After a bit of searching I found a new distillery in the Niagara region called Dillon's. Now it was important to work with a willing distiller as the recipe requires a number of steps such as adding liquids daily for two weeks. Uh, it's just not a, a macerate type bitters production. So the first thing we had to do is prepare our used bourbon barrel and it's a, actually a four roses bourbon barrel. So we cut a hole in the top that allowed us to get the spice sack in and then we added the uh, corn whiskey and we tied a piece of rope so we could fish out the, the spice sack after two weeks. And the rope was also handy to move the spices around so we could get good extraction. According to the recipe, once the spices and the high proof corn distillate are in the barrel, uh, every couple of days a certain amount of water is to be added to lower the proof of the bitters, eventually coming out at about 50% ABV. After two weeks, the spices are pulled out of the barrel, leaving approximately 40 gallons of bitters. The recipe then states that the bitters should be aged for a minimum of three weeks, but they improve with longer aging. By May 1st, 2013, the bitters will have been aging for roughly five weeks. The plan is to do a taste test after five weeks of aging, and depending on how they taste, uh, they may be ready for bottling, but most likely they'll need uh, another two to four weeks of aging before they're ready. It's expected that the bitters will ship in mid to late May, possibly early June, depending on the aging. There will only be 1,400 bottles available. Obviously, there's only one barrel, and there is no timeline for another batch to be made anytime soon. Because logistically, this has been a pretty complicated process, and there are limits to how much bark we can actually harvest. Now, I need to thank a number of people who have helped me with this project. Uh, the first is Ted Hay. He's been immensely helpful and generous with his time and information. He shared a lot of his research with me, and he's the one who did the comparative tasting between my Abbott's Bitters and the old vintage Abbott's Bitters that he has, and that would have been impossible for me to do, as I didn't have any vintage Abbott's lying around my liquor cabinet. Next is obviously Jesse Card. He's been so generous with his time and help and you know, doing a lot of legwork to get me down there so I could pick the bark. And without his help, this bitters project may have never actually got into the barrel. Jesse recently moved back to Portland, so if you happen to be in the city, you can check him out behind the bar at Raven and Rose or Hale Pele. Next, I need to thank Robert Hess, who's been very generous with his research information, and also for the mass spec data, which helped me fill in a lot of the gaps when trying to solve this bitters mystery. And a thanks goes out to Philip Duff for his efforts in trying to find a source for the canal of bark, Though unsuccessful, his effort was still appreciated. And last but not least, Dave Wondrich, who shared some of his Abbott's research with me and also did a comparative tasting between a sample I sent him and a vintage bottle that he had. For information on how to pre-order your bottle of Abbott's Bitters, check out artofdrink.com. And if you have any questions regarding this presentation, please feel free to post a comment, send me an email, or post a question on Facebook or Twitter, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I look forward to hearing your comments.